thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I know that UX budgets are pretty tight, and here in London especially, you've got a lot of conferences to attend. And uh, so again, uh, to all the presenters here, uh, thank you for sharing your day with us. Uh, it really means a lot to us. It's really cool to see the design and UX community kind of really uh, flourish and develop here in London, and it's exciting to be a part of this event here today with you guys. So again, thanks to the guys in the back filming and Sergey and everyone putting this on. All right, so let's get started, yeah? So appealing to writers and elephants, what the hell is that, right? Okay, so this is me. Uh, I design dashboards. Uh, I do a lot of dashboards, actually. Um, I, I really appreciate them as living documents. And over years of doing these, I just really love the fact that they're super fluid. Uh, they're, they're really complex, complex and compact kind of narratives, and they always tell a story. Uh, they're never neutral. Um, you know, you, you kind of package this information up in a certain way, you present the information, you, you hand it over to, to someone else, and they're supposed to accept this information and make decisions off of it and respond in a certain way. That's what good dashboards do. And I guess what's really, what, what I've really found out over the years is there's kind of three things that, like how these dashboards are consumed and how they're disseminated and dispersed, and, and I guess the effectiveness of these dashboards are kind of based on three things, like timing, the style and the substance. And I'm also, I'm also a UX researcher as well. And so I, I, what that means is I go out and I talk to customers, right? I, I go out and I talk to people, interview them, watch them, observe them, survey them, whatever. And I, you know, me and my team, we take all that back and we s distill it, we synthesize it, and we make these insights. We make whatever it is, the deliverable that comes out of it, could, depends on a number of things. Um, but we package it up and we serve it to the people who are making the product decisions, right? Like we package it in a way that, you know, is give, in a manner in which they were to respond and to make good decisions, hopefully, and build great products off of it. Um, and the success and kind of dissemination of these insights are basically built around three things. You guessed it, style, substance, and the timing. And so, you know, I began to kind of ask myself, like, why, you know, these are well-meaning people, and, you know, when we give this information to them, we package it a certain way, um, troves of, of data and information, how can they continue to make bad decisions? I think we know this to be true, right? The, the quality of the information that you're given doesn't necessarily equate to really good product decision making. And even take it a step further, you know, more ethical questions like, what's my role in communicating this evidence? Like, how am I contributing to the confusion? Um, what's my role in kind of, if I'm, am I part of the solution or part of the problem? So, like most good designers, I got really academic about it. Uh, I bought a lot of books and started reading. You know, how do people make decisions? Um, and, and please, uh, take your phone out and take a picture of this slide. I highly recommend it. Uh, not only will this eight books make you a better designer, but they'll make you a better person too. These are fantastic, fantastic books by excellent authors. Um, anyway, so I started reading a bunch of stuff, and I guess there was, most of these referenced one particular author in one particular book, and this was Jonathan Haidt's Happiness Hypothesis, and it, they kept referencing Haidt's uh, metaphor of this rider and this elephant, the rider being logic and reason, and the elephant being intuition, and kind of gut and emotion. And uh, so Jonathan Haidt's a professor at NYU, uh, in the Stern School of Business. He's an MBA professor there. And he describes his human consciousness this way. You can kind of see it, the elephant there, and there's kind of a ride around top. This, this kind of human consciousness and decision making, so this divided self, where you have the horse and the I'm sorry, the rider and the elephant together. And he uses this metaphor quite a bit from dieting, uh, why we can't keep New Year's resolutions to just approving design decisions. And I think this is really key for us, right? Because from my experience, uh, there's always been an educational component in design. Um, it's never been about the noun design. It's always been about the verb design for me in my career. Um, I'm always teaching others how to work with design, how to interact with designers, how to interact with customers, and how to design interactions with all of us together as a team. So what is exactly that we do here, right? Um, well, we're in the change management business. That's how I like to call it. Uh, so we're changing the user behavior, of course. 
you know, one flow over another flow. Uh, but we're also changing stakeholder behavior as well. Uh, I think a part, a large part of what we do as designers is we also kind of influence the culture and the teams that we work with. I think that's extremely undervalued. And of course, I think you also change your own behavior. Once you kind of understand the customer and the user more, you begin to be more informed as a designer. And your challenges and your, your assumptions are challenged and you begin to make kind of more informed decisions. So the happiness hypothesis is it's a better way to understand um, the audience itself and kind of bridge that gap when applied well between the people who make the product and the people who use it. And kind of how do you tailor your interactions with the people you work with internally? How do you nuance certain deliverables or certain like communication styles depending on the stakeholder or, or the team member you're working with? Uh, and the happiness hypothesis really proposes just that, that happiness. Um, when applied correctly and you're doing and you're, you're communicating your work effectively and using it this way, the, the user will be happy. Uh, the, the work will be better. The experience will be better. The stakeholders will be happy. And you and your team will be happy because you've just elevated the value of design. So let me set the stage here. This is a typical uh, design review, uh, product review at Zendesk. They don't always happen in a big conference room like this, but this is a, a good amount. Like it's usually like four or five or six people, and uh, you know these people make decisions, and they're beautiful and they're flawed, and I love the hell out of them. But you know they they often uh, bring many beliefs and backgrounds to the table that kind of inform like why things happen at Zendesk and why things don't. And so if if design and what we're doing is just a series of decision making. Like, I can't ignore the people here. I can't ignore the personhood behind the decision, yes? So I'm, I'm not picking on uh, John Rees, but this is kind of the lean product cycle, right? Like, build, measure, learn. Um, there are many others, too, like design thinking, and you've seen the double triangle, the double diamond, I believe. Um, and there are many processes out there, but I think it really ignores, like, the people and the relationships behind this process, right? And I, th I don't think we can really ignore that. So to me, it's kind of more like this, uh, the OODA loop, where you know, you've got a ton of beliefs, a myriad of external factors, a lot of circumstantial stuff that's happening, maybe external pressures. You know, maybe that certain person didn't have their coffee that morning, or they're coming out of a bad relationship, or they missed sales for that quarter, or whatever. Like All these things are kind of happening to them as they're talking about the, or discussing design with you. And I guess, if there's one takeaway from my talk here, I hope that everyone here can, can step back for a moment and maybe reconsider how communicating your design and your research and your insights may be contributing to the confusion, maybe contributing and harming the work as opposed to helping it. So maybe let's pause and rethink like the style and the substance and the timing of like our deliverables, the designs that we make, and also the meetings and the communications around it. So why is it so dang hard. Well, I like to call it kind of the journey of the idea. Uh, Victor Hugo and Les Miserables said, the straight line, a respectable optical illusion which ruins many a man. And I had, I kind of believed this for a while. I had this reinforced kind of belief or notion that my design process was pretty linear in the sense that, you know, the story accepted by the PM, then get buy-in from engineering, Okay, now we're prototyping, now we're doing validation on that, we're doing design crits, uh, we gotta neuter it way back to, for an MVP or whatever, something that's way watered down, and then we gotta do like a QA. So it's kinda like this very step-by-step -step process, right? And, and that just one size fits all of kind of talking about design for me, it wasn't really working. Um, I understood, I, well, I understood that I had to step back and map the entire conversation, and you know, how I kind of reframed my work across all these touch points and these internal like hurdles, uh, it had to survive this internal gauntlet, so to speak, right? So, you know, there are many more. I'm just kind of bucketing these in pretty generic categories. But if you think about it this way, you know, before a design, before a design gets in front of any user, you'll have to interact with someone internally who didn't do this work and you will have to tell, talk to them about this work in a way that makes sense to them. 
right? Because good design is not obvious, right? Right, I hope? Okay. And so even when you have like a really good operating rhythm, um, if you've got this sense of like hivishness or synchronicity where your team is really tight and you're, and you're kind of moving together, coordinated together, uh, studies actually show that communication increases, actually. Your, your need for sharing and communication actually goes up. So, how you facilitate discussions and support your designs may be more important than design itself. Okay, so enter the rider and the elephant metaphor. Hype put it this way, he said, if you want to change things, you've got to appeal to both the elephant, intuition, and the rider, reason. The rider provides the planning and the direction, and the elephant provides the energy. So if you reach the riders on your team, but not the elephants, team members will have the understanding without the motivation. If you reach the elephants, but not the riders, they'll have the passion without the direction. And in both cases, the flaws can be paralyzing. So the reluctant elephant and the wheel spinning rider can ensure that nothing meaningful changes. But when the elephant and the rider can move together, great things can be achieved. So, okay, so what happens next? I mean, what keeps the elephants and riders from kind of moving in the same direction together? Well, uh, this is a gross oversimplification, but let's say political hurdles, cognitive hurdles and resource hurdles. And so I'll start with the first one, political hurdles. Back to this room here, right? So for the longest time, I thought that political hurdles meant, oh, it's product versus engineering, or uh, design versus engineering, or kind of us versus them, instead of using like a we kind of mentality, right? Um, maybe if I just used more data to the engineers, they would get it. Or uh, if I told Rebel a better story or kind of nuanced it better, like my design would get moved through critiques a lot easier. Um, you know, I, I thought it was a vernacular thing and kind of a language and parlance thing, um, which is true. I think there's a lot that has a lot to do with it and kind of how you nuance your design, your communications around it. Um, but I also think it's cultural and geographical as well. Um, boy, did I learn this the hard way when I moved to France. Yeah, so uh, story time. And so briefly, uh, this is Aaron Meyer's cultural maps. Uh, so it breaks down kind of this, this way of kind of doing international business around the world. And, uh, you know, I, I would assume here, how many people here work for kind of a global organization? Raise your hand. How many people have customers around the world or clientele around the world? Okay, great. All right, that helps. Well, Aaron, Aaron kind of lays out seven areas, uh, communication, evaluation, leading, deciding, trusting, disagreeing, and scheduling. I've only pictured four here because we're talking about kind of how design and business kind of relate to one another. Um, but you can see right away, uh, when I came in and I said, all right, here's the American from San Francisco, Texas actually, but here's the American. All right, let's get this French team together and we're gonna do, we're gonna do a design sprint. We're going to bring like design thinking to, to this office here, right? Uh, oh man, the hubris, right? And uh, the first thing that happened was, you know, all, all the French people were, were extremely quiet. And they were very, like, like why, is this, why is this happening? You know, French people are usually like very uh, verbose and they like to kind of be confrontational. Like, what's happening here? Um, what I didn't realize was uh, they were actually intimidated to give ideas because the head of engineering was part of the design sprint. And because they respect such a strong kind of hierarchical hierarchy in their organization, they weren't free to kind of open up these ideas. And so, man, did I screw up by, by doing that? I, I've learned since then, and there, we've kind of re-swizzled our, our design sprints to kind of accommodate like the different cultural situations as well. Um, so yeah, the French are, you know, again, I think these are like dominant characteristics. By no means does this characterize like every person in every country by, by any means. But um, I, you know, I trust Erin Meyer and her, her, you know, thousands and thousands of pages of research to say that, yeah, I would agree the French are more likely to give positive feedback more implicitly and discreetly. And they're more likely to give negative feedback uh, directly and bluntly and publicly. 
And so how, how else would this play out? Okay, well, let's say um, uh, as an American, uh, I am taught to give presentations or maybe talk uh, about a topic a certain way. You may have seen this or heard this. It's first, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. And then lastly, I'm going to tell you again what I just told you. Right? Um, business schools throughout the US teach this, right? Um, but when I, do, when I pull this off in France, they're like, you're treating us like idiots. Why are you doing this? Like, this makes no sense to us. Uh, you're treating us like, like fools. Uh, we need more context. Don't be so simple-minded. So, and and I just want, I'm just going to add in here as well, like, uh, when you're talking about work and you're working with any stakeholder, whether it be a design peer or, or, or C-suite, like, please, I beg you, please don't, like, put something up and ask, what do you think? That's like the, oh, that's cringeworthy, and uh, it's like a homework assignment from school. Um, you want to have a, a more polished presentation than that. Um, and I have Thailand on here, uh, just because as a UX researcher, UX researcher, excuse me, I find this extremely fascinating, right? Um, how hard must it be, and I haven't done this, to extract like useful insights when you do on-site visits and interview uh, people from Thailand? Think about that and the cultural biases there. So I guess the point of this slide here is think about cultural relativity, right? Um, what you perceive about the culture may be biasing and influencing you, right? So know yourself, know yourself, get in there and be true to yourself. Okay, so resource hurdles. Now, um, this is, yeah, so I'm not talking about like the people you don't have to help out with this. I'm talking about the people you do have who maybe shouldn't be there. This is Frank, there's a saying called get the right people on the bus, right? And so there's too much data to point out, but you know, there's a direct correlation between how employees engage with one another and how they collaborate, and then how the effectiveness of like the ups and downs of morale versus like one sensitivity or, or information readiness, how they're open or closed-minded. And cognitive hurdles. So these are fun, we all know this. We just saw this slide uh, from Tom. This is really just, again, it's fine print and it's small because there's over 200 of them. I can't believe it. And riders and elephants have their share as well. So I'll pick my favorite. Uh, does everyone know who this is, right? Yeah, OJ, yeah. So this is actually, this was hilarious. It's called the rhyme and reason effect. So rhyming statements are perceived as more truthful. So when Johnny Cochran, his defense attorney, said, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. That resonated with jurors, and that became kind of a headline throughout the media frenzy. All right, so back to this, back to the stage here. So, riders and elephants, you know, who, like, which is dominant right now? Is it the riders, the elephant? And because the first step for me was to conduct like ethnographic studies on on my team, and the people in the room. And so. You know, we've got kind of intuition and reasoning here, and we've got. I'm trying to map these people, map the decision makers out, kind of on this grid. Like, I know who is a yes, and I kind of know, understand who's a no, but the maybes there. That's who I kind of want to focus on, right? Like, what what modifications and or nuances and kind of like my design deliverables don't need to kind of dial up or tone back, uh, and most importantly, like, what do they believe right now? Because that could change over time. And so it's good to give them the facts and stories. OK. All right, Brent. So what does the writer need, right? Um, this is easy enough. Show me the numbers, right? So this is that, that kind of neocortex that kind of is on the front. It's the system one thinkers that Neil Kahneman talks about. Right? So these people can imagine alternatives that are not visually present. Um, the control system allows people to think about long-term goals and escape like the tyranny of the here and now. So data is basically what we're talking about. It's designed. It's how it's collected, how it's presented. But it's also what's absent, too. Riders are very perceptive of the data that's not there. Um, and I also think this is why qualitative, re qualitative researchers excuse me, have a hard time in engineering organizations. Because I think that engineers have an easier time with math because it's familiar to them. They're, they're comfortable and competent with numbers. And so they want answers in numbers. 
And I think that's why, I mean, even in the face of, or even when the solution or the answer requires like a, a fuller, richer picture. Um, establish clear steps. So smaller chunks is good. And what appears to be resistance is actually lack of clarity. So make sure you provide crystal clear direction. Uh, we usually show a slide of like, here's an MVP of a car, and then we work it all the way back to a skateboard. Knowing those steps and chunks and the milestones along the way are very helpful to riders. And so this may look like, instead of giving broad strokes of user feedback, like this onboarding is bad, or we have evidence that says this is bad, uh, we can give them specific areas to prove, like, let's reduce the sign-up form from four fields to three, something like that. Uh, point to the destination. So this is really important as well. So they, want, they just want to make sure that you've thought it through. Uh, map to revenue, if possible. If you can bring in MRR numbers, things like that, that's extremely helpful. Emphasize cohesion with other successful projects. So if you've proven yourself in other areas, they want to see that it fits in the bigger picture. OK, what does the elephant need? Uh, vision casting, inspiration, that limbic system, that gut, right? that emotional response, the system to thinkers. Tell that story. This, we're good at this. We're designers, right? So this is the part we excel at, whether it's like this Freitzig's pyramid, where we kind of have a beginning, a middle, and an end, we have a denouement, whatever. You're building this kind of narrative. You know, romance them a bit, right? This could be the hero's journey, how you talk about a project, or a user journey over time, right? Because what looks like laziness is really just exhaustion. Uh, so engage people's attentions and their emotions. Romance them a bit. You can do this by... Uh, putting up a feature or a product and in, in like mock it up in like product hunt. They go bananas. Uh, create a sense of urgency. So put the fire under the butt by pointing out or illustrating kind of how big the breakdowns are in the UI. Are customers leaving? Are we churning? Do we have a burn rate? Things like that. Really get the elephant motivated. And less is better effect. So shrink that change. So the tendency for elephants is to prefer like smaller chunks and to be able to kind of understand that over kind of larger chunks maybe judged separately. All right. So Brent, how do we do this in Zendesk? OK, well, what methods can we use to appeal to both? Let's give this a whirl. And you know, this is basically interaction design. So let's hack this. Let's get after it. Let's do some design work. So how can we do this? We can help shape the group interactions. And one way we do this at Zendesk is through a flavor of design sprints. And does anyone practice design sprints currently through? OK. That's actually less than I thought. Um, they're a tremendous tool. Uh, it's a great way of taking broad thinking. Uh, it's also a great way to be inclusive of your process as well and to compress that down into the most efficient way possible. Usually around five days can be less. But what I love about this is it gets kind of these different perspectives, uh, different walks of life, different backgrounds in a room, and it kind of ignores formal roles and hierarchies. So it doesn't matter who your title is. Uh, if you truly believe that, I, that great ideas can come from anyone, design sprints is your game. That's, that's, that's where it's at. Uh, I kind of equate it to super colliders in a way, where you, know, you have these people and these ideas you have these elements, and you try and get them in a confined space. These materials are here, and you condense and compress that space in a way that eventually produces like new material. And so that's what I love about it. You throw these perspectives and people from different organizations in a room, and through sketching, through visualizing, things like that, you come up with new product ideas. Um, these are great. When they work well, they, they kind of beget more questions and more, more sessions. And if these are functioning well, um, these kind of really break up kind of the autopilot, the routines that, that other stakeholders and decision makers may make that kind of reinforce kind of bad beliefs. So um, a pro tip would be uh, don't make it about like the thing you're going to ship. Like if you want to start out small, like make it about a tool or a process um, so people aren't really emotional about what we're building and, and why. Um, you can make make a very condensed kind of design sprint about maybe how you communicate like work or research. Uh, Ride-alongs are really fun for us as well. So this is Vincent. He's kind of, 
He's hanging out with us here uh, at Eve Sleep, um, which have great mattresses, by the way. Uh, so taking business owners and stakeholders with you really kind of puts them in front, and we've talked about this a lot today, but it puts them in front of the software and you see the users kind of struggling with it. It can really, when you're back in the office, it really kind of shortcuts like a lot of this kind of back and forth discussion. Uh, it really humanizes that decision when they make it because they've seen it firsthand. Um, yeah, okay. I'm gonna just go to the next one. Uh, the written interactions, okay. So, uh, don't do decks. Decks suck. They're just a ton of time. I mean, all right, so you have to do them. So, I mean, we have a Confluence page with all the transcriptions and the notes, and we have them, but uh, man, uh, no one sits through a 50-page deck, yet alone 10 slides. Uh, so we do something like this. We have one sheets that we put together, and it's kind of editorial in style a bit, um, but we synthesize all of our findings, and we kind of make a one sheet of important facts, both qualitative and quantitative data, and stakeholders get this, uh, product marketing people get this as well, so they can start building like taglines and, and, and pitch stuff out of it as well. Uh, and what I love about it is, is it also goes analog. It, we go offline with this uh, and, and gorilla a little bit. And so yeah, that, that we've put some one sheets above the urinals there. Uh, so we've got your undivided attention. And again, like bring the user, bring the person closer to the maker, and you know, if we've got you right there, uh, you can't help but kind of understand and read about what the customer's doing. And we do, we do some like slicing and dicing of, of videos as well. As the gentleman in the back will tell you, like, it takes a lot of freaking time and effort and work to really edit down a video. But consider this, it's a really powerful tool. Um, if, you, uh, if you are kind of building and creating a narrative, right, like you can edit it a certain way to give to your stakeholder to kind of communicate your point of view. So this, this technique, while though like highly effective, um, isn't entirely neutral. I'll just say that. Uh, we've also done like watching parties. So the, after the team is done and we've kind of maybe shipped it, uh, part of our retrospective is we'll get, uh, just have an open invitation of people in the office to come watch like usability testing recordings. And it's great because as a researcher and designer, all I really have to do is press play. And we've already edited these videos. We already have kind of it chopped up in very kind of palatable and, and very digestible chunks. And, and what happens is we just kind of sit back. And what's great is the business owners and the different teams start talking and arguing and debating amongst themselves. So this conversation really happens naturally once they're in the room. And you know, we, we, I slack it to stakeholders as well if they're snowflakes and it makes them feel like really personal. And okay, I'll say, and last but not least, I would say design the, the personal interactions. And this has been touched on quite a bit today, but uh, I, again, like if, we, if we're really in the business of change management, and if, and if your design is always in the minority, and we're outnumbered, and we need to kind of boost our potency as designers, like how do we do that? And I think the best way to do that is to design our personal interactions with one another. Particularly, you know, my, you know, my pro tip has been that alignment around the design and the insights, that that agreement and that sign-off happened way before my design review. That design, that, that rapport and that kind of relationship I've built happened over like an espresso two weeks ago with that stakeholder. So my pro tip to you would be is deliver that kind of everyday empathy. Turn that ethnographic studies on your own team. Uh, you know, it's been said um, eloquently by other presenters here today, but, but get to know them. Uh, pick one thing, create a safe space and figure out what makes them tick. You know, do they feel trusted? Uh, do they feel valued in their organization? Are they scared? Um, are they, ask them what they're worried about next week. What keeps them up at night? Um, how's their, you know, you don't have to get super personal, but like, you know, well, you know, how are, you know what would you do this weekend? You know, how's your family life? You know, how are your kids? You know, sh you know shoot the bull, whatever. Uh, build that rapport because I think that goes a long way. Um, yeah, connect with them on a personal level. That's the best way to get designs and UX kind of valued. Okay, so back to the elephant and the rider. Um, so just in summary, 
Haidt says, the elephant and the rider each have their own intelligence. And when they work together, they enable the unique brilliance of human beings. And that's kind of how I would like to end to, uh, my talk is, you know, f right now we're in a room, we're UX practitioners, um, and our job is not being done by robots. We don't have AI yet making decisions yet about digital products. Um, I've seen some of that kind of happen. Uh, and frankly, that's just not fun. Um, part of this you know, ongoing interaction with design and part of what we do is the relationships and the, and, and the networks that we create and build. If we are really doing human-centered design and we have a human-centered process, um, that's what's happy to me. That's what happiness is. You know, the people, you know, uh, the PMs and engineers who are, are truly jerks and, you know, it's one thing to kind of go out and talk to a customer and conduct usability tests with customers and develop empathy for them. But you know, it's another thing to really fall in love and really have empathy for someone who leaves like the trash in the sink or maybe pulls the apple core and, and kind of the recycling glass piece and like not the right bin, you know? Um, or uh, descopes a project like 80% or maybe kind of like CC alls that you know, kind of like email bully or something like that, right? So I guess my, my, what I would encourage you to do is, you know, even though it's messy and ugly and gross, like the people that make these decisions and people that make these products are the most beautiful thing about it. So yes, we can better understand each other by using the happiness hypothesis. So thank you very much. <laughs>